over the years, I featured a couple of different music slash collectible formats that were aimed at children. If we go back to the early 2000s, we're talking about hit clips, small cartridges that contained digital music files that held up to two minutes of audio from current popular hits. And these could be played on a number of different devices. If we take that idea and move it back to the late 1980s, we're looking at the format called Pocket Rockers. Very similar idea, but this time the audio was held on tiny endless loop tape cartridges. But now we're going back even further for the subject of today's video. We're going back to the late 1960s and we're looking at the Mighty Tiny. And that one held its music on tiny records. I think it's getting on for 10 years since I first saw this rather haunting image and unsurprisingly it's stuck in the mind. There's just something incredibly creepy about that picture. But as a result, I've been looking for one of these all that time and finally I've managed to get hold of one and some records to go with it. It will come as no surprise to anyone that it doesn't work. So we've got to have a look at that first of all. So uh, let's have a look at the Mighty Tiny. Right, well, let me give you the tour. It's not going to take an awful long time. We can see the name up there, Mighty Tiny. On either side here, these holes, that's not an earphone or a headphone output. That's just where a handle would have once been connected up to this. The amplification side of this is purely acoustic rather than electronic. It's all in the lid section here. That's your stylus that, of course, moves in towards the centre of the record, drawn in by the groove on the disc and that is attached to a diaphragm, I suppose, in the top. And it sounds slightly amplified, although not very much, but that side of things is probably all right. It's this part that's not working. That's our turntable, and you'll see the bits that protrude up from there. They've got a, a notch in the edge of each of them, and that's to hold the disc in place and make sure it doesn't spin separately to the rest of the thing. I'll show you what I mean. That's the side that we're not going to be playing, of course. That's the side we would. And those, therefore, you just pop it on anywhere, but in the process of it spinning around, those catch under the edges of these and stop the thing from spinning in the other direction. Now, as far as the power goes, one double A just goes in the bottom here. And I'm having no luck at all with the power. Um, nothing is happening and I don't think it's a connection I think there's something else going on of course it will only work when you close the lid so the idea is once that's pushed down that's going to create the connection inside and then it would spin and you just open the lid like that so something's not working at the bottom could just be a, a mucky connection I don't know if there's a belt in here that needs attaching rubber band or whatever we're gonna to have to open it up and find out what's wrong with this hopefully we'll get it playing it's not going to sound good just be aware of that but uh, I want to see what it does sound like so let's see if we can open it up I've got a feeling with this one it's either going to be very simple or completely broken we'll find out in a moment so there's four screws to take out in the base here there's two at the back which look a little bit awkward to get to. I'll see if I can get down the side of the lid to get to those. I don't really want to take the lid off. So let's just see if we can angle in from the side. Yeah, we're all right. There are two screws at the bottom here that I didn't see before. So we'll take those out. I've never seen one of these advertised in working order at a reasonable price. I have seen a couple of collector's ones at crazy prices but then again they come with a load of discs and the box and things it took me quite a few years to find this one so i'm hoping we can get it working right so it seems to be coming apart now the lid just came off completely so there's a couple of connectors in there it looks like not expecting that what is that oh it's, it's just it looks like a battery thing but it's actually just holding the uh, lid open purely mechanical okay right well let's get in here just check the wires on that motor look all right okay lift this off well there's not an awful lot going on in there there's our belt notice how the section attached to the motor there has a kind of etching on it which would help the belt to grip 
it's a round belt that and it is loose but that wasn't the issue because nothing was spinning at all before but this is the speed control so that's the section that you adjust the speed and as you can see here it moves it along this coil of wire maybe that was just a little bit oxidized didn't think of adjusting the speed because the thing wasn't working at all so maybe it's fine let's pop a battery in Well, nothing happening at all yet. Let's just spin the motor a bit. Yeah, it's not got caught up. So there's no power getting to it. I was trying to figure out where the power switch is and I'll just get a light in here. Don't know if you can see that down there. There's a couple of connectors there under what looks like a washer. And going into that section, we've got a blue wire on one side and a white one on the other. So the switch is underneath the platter. So I think we need to try and get the platter off and see what's going on there. I'm hoping I can do this without breaking anything. This is a bit risky. Of course, it was never designed to come off. That's the issue we've got here. So I think we'll attack it from this side. So let's get this bracket off. This is a little bit more complicated than I was expecting. Right, so we'll lift that off there. So now what we want to do is to separate these two halves so that I can get underneath here and see what's going on with that switch that's supposed to start it. Now, how do these two halves come apart? I'm just using force at the moment because I can't see any other way of doing this. I'm hoping I'm moving this one on the right, but I don't know if I am. Yeah, I can't see a split in that at all. So I don't think that's a split washer. There isn't one up here. Just need to try and work these two halves apart. Let's just take the belt off again. Right, I'm really not winning with this, but I can see what's going on. I might just try spraying some contact cleaner in there, because what happens is we've got a metal leaf coming in from this side, another one over here. Around the center here is a metal wheel. And therefore, when it gets pushed down, that wheel connects both those bits together and that's effectively our on off switch. Now whilst I was moving things around that has become detached from that. I'll just attach it to this part so that we can make sure we've got a permanent connection. We could just put a wire from there to there bypassing the switch just to see if this thing's working. Well not a lot going on there. Give it a bit of a spin. Right yeah there's our issue. Our motor is dead. Okay, all I can think of doing at this point is spraying some contact cleaner into the motor, spinning it around manually, and seeing if that brings it back to life. Right, well that's drenched it, so let's give it a spin. Ah, motor's spinning. Right, as far as I can tell, that seems to be running pretty cleanly now. I've run it for a couple of minutes there. So let's see if the rest of these contacts actually work on here. Yeah, that's not working. Hold on, no it is. Just about reluctantly. I'd suggest a load of contact cleaner down the middle here. It's like the solution to everything today, this. If I just make sure this scrapes those off, we should get a good connection in the middle there. Yeah. Couple more things to do. Got to solder that wire back onto this, but also I'm going to give this a bit of a clean here so that when that touches against these wires, you get a good connection. I'm also going to spray a bit of stuff on here while I'm here, might as well. Now I noticed the belt was a little bit tricky to get on with this in place, so I'm going to leave it for the moment and sort the belt out, put that on there before I put the bracket on the top of it. And by sorting it out, I mean I'm going to boil it in water. That's something that a lot of people suggest in the comments whenever I replace a belt. They say, why didn't you just boil it in water? Well, the reason is because I've got a replacement belt in those things usually, and I want them to work for many years later. Boiling a belt is a very temporary measure. It's not going to last for years to come. However, 
on this occasion I only need this thing to last for a couple of hours whilst I do a demonstration in this video I'll probably never play it again so what we need to do is boil this up it should make the belt a little bit better at gripping on here perhaps a little bit more supple but also might tighten it up a bit so we'll see we'll see if it's any better just to demonstrate where it is at the moment and you can see there how loose it is if I pop it at the top of here works its way down to the bottom it's not bad but I think it could just be a little bit more springy and it would help things out right well it is still quite loose it doesn't seem to make much difference in that regard although it does seem ever so slightly more grippy than it was before so hopefully that will help us when it comes to playing a record let's reassemble this and give it a go. All right, so here's the mechanism. Yeah, even with the friction of my finger, that's got enough torque to pull the record around. So I think we should be okay. Let's pop it back in the case. I've just realized that this is similar to the shape of a coffin. I don't know if there's any significance in that. With the benefit of hindsight, I now realise the disassembly was done in the wrong order. You need to take those two screws out of the bottom first, which then removes the lid and enables you to get better access to these two at the back. Right, I think we're ready to go. OK, are you ready to be blown away by the sound of the mighty tiny? Let's pop this one on that we'd already got out. Here we go. Let's try another one. It seems to be jabbing itself down a little bit. There's plenty of torque there. The needle just seems to be pushing down a little bit too hard from the top here. Maybe I should have a look inside this part. Right, so we've got four screws in here. Right, well, there's not an awful lot going on in here. You can see we've got our stylus, which is just attached to this piece of plastic. The other end of there, that little bit of metal, that's going to be pushing against this plastic cone, which is still intact. So that's as good as it's going to get. It's just such a basic rudimentary mechanism that it doesn't really stand much chance of working properly. I think what I can do, though, just to maybe help it a little bit. Perhaps put a drop of oil or grease on this section here. This um, post might just help it to move in a little bit. You can see here, once you lift the lid, that then returns to the beginning like that. Let's just pop it back in. There we go. Give it another go. Very enthusiastic about spinning now, so let's have a listen. And that's it. Well, at least it played all the way through that time. <laughs> Whether that's a good thing or not, I don't know. Right now, as you can see, I've got a couple of records here, a couple of empty record sleeves. Which one goes in which? Of course, they don't have the names of the track printed on them. However, on the back, you'll see there are numbers. This one is 137, so that corresponds with that. So we know that that one goes in there, and this one will go in the other one. That's 128. One thing that I do like about these is the amount of effort that they've gone to to do the little record sleeves on them. That's the best one so far. 
<laughs> and if you've just come in the video at this point, you're thinking, flipping out, what were the others like? Well, they weren't good. This Mighty Tiny came out in 1970. It was made by Ohio Art, a company that's perhaps most famous for bringing out the Etcher sketch. Although this product wasn't one of their creations, it actually came out a few years earlier under a different label. It was Pointer Products, that's Don Pointer. He created this, and you might not be familiar with the name Don Pointer, but it's very unlikely that you won't have encountered one of his odd novelty creations at some point. In fact, just by pure chance on this channel many years ago, I featured a useless machine. That's the box where you turn it on and then a, a finger reaches out and switches itself back off again. The original one of those was one of his creations. And then there was the similarly themed coin bank where the disembodied hand of Thing out of the Adams family would reach out and pull the coins inside. You might have seen the light bulb that lit up when held in the hand. I had one of those as a child. I don't know if it was an official one, but the secret to lighting mine up was a metal ring that you concealed in your palm to bridge a connection. And you must be aware of the crossword toilet paper, even if you haven't seen it in person. There are some pointer novelties that are so established, you might assume that they've always been here. For example, here's his patent application for the basketball backboard that clips onto a waste bin. And of course, there were many more things besides. But you can see from that that in general, pointer products were never intended to be taken too seriously. They were just an affordable, fun novelty. And of course, the same would go for this thing. It was never going to be a high quality music player. But despite that fact, Discogs do have a section for these records, and they estimate that the total number that came out for the format was 51. The miniature records were sold in multi-packs, and as well as the surprisingly large number of titles, there was also an alternative player for these in the style of a miniature stereo console. This was called the Stereo Pet. But of course, it wasn't stereo. It was just the same mechanism in a differently shaped case. Tomy also released a version of this system in Japan where rather than music, the records there contained sound effects. I'll provide links to the websites and videos where you can find out more about these in the video description. While we're talking about toy records, I should mention the tiny shellac gramophone records that were created for Queen Mary's Dolls House in 1924. This one-off miniature wind-up gramophone really was capable of playing these 10-second long records. Replicas of the Dolls House discs were sold at the 1924 British Empire exhibition, and in 2005, one of these replicas containing a rendition of God Save the King sold at Christie's for £384. Now, it might surprise you to learn that I was not the person who won that Christie's auction. Therefore, I don't have one of those Dolls House records to compare in size against the record for the Mighty Tiny. But fortunately, due to all the documentation on the Dolls House, we do know the size of the records that went on that record player, and they were 34 millimetres across. Now, I could just measure that out on here, but just to give you a better visual representation of the difference in size between the two, this bottle of glucose tablets just so happens to have a 34 millimeter diameter lid. So there you go. That's what the Dolls House record would have looked like in comparison to the one from the Mighty Tidy. In fact, if I get the plastic retaining section off the lid, we can overlay that on the top and you can see it's a heck of a lot smaller. So this one was claiming to be the world's smallest record player and whilst it didn't say the world's smallest records, the player itself is still significantly larger than the one for the doll's house, and the records are larger as well. But I'm going to give it the benefit of the doubt. After all, you could go ahead and buy one of these. There was only one of the other model, and it was owned by royalty. So your average person wouldn't be able to get hold of one of those, but they could get hold of one of these. So this is the smallest record player and records that anyone was likely to be able to buy. Now, I'd like to see if I can get any sound out of one of these when it's played on a regular record player. Now, the issues we're going to have is, first off, it's very small. It's probably got the wrong size of stylus. The speed on this, I believe, is somewhere between 80 and 90 RPM, but perhaps we can get quite close to it with this record player, which goes up to 78 and has a pitch control. But also, the hole in the middle is the wrong size. And in addition to that, perhaps the worst problem is going to be the fact this is a hill and dale type recording, vertically cut. So rather than a regular record player having a wobbly line going around it, this actually goes up and down. But I'd imagine we can still get some sound out of it, so let's have a go. 
Right, we'll start it off with that whole issue. Let's just lay it on its back and put a spider on it. So I'm going to tape that to it. I'm going to try and get it central as close as I can at least, and then that at least will solve that issue. Right, let's see how close I got with that. Not perfect, but it should do. Let's knock the speed on this up to 78. Let's turn the pitch control to the top. Uh, we'll put the volume on. Let's have a go. Well, clearly at the wrong speed and a little bit off centre, but we could hear something there. Let's try another one. I'll try and get it more centred up and I'm going to record it to my PCM recorder. Speed up the audio, boost the sound a bit and let's have a listen. But that's it. I hope you've enjoyed having a look at, if not having a listen to, the Mighty Tiny, the tiny record format that came out in the late 1960s, lasted into the early 1970s, and had the incredibly weird box art. But I think we should finish this video off with a beautiful analogue rendition of Oh Susanna by Banjo Pete. That's it for the moment. As always, thanks for watching.